Okay, this is the, 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 the fiscal update of the budget. When we talk about the fiscal update, I feel like a school teacher to tell all of you to keep quiet. <laughs> all governments since the Ratumara government in Fiji has had a budget deficit, except three times in our history. What is deficit put simply? It means in that particular year, the amount of money you have as revenue, the amount of money you collect, and the amount of money you're going to spend. Nearly all governments in the world, even countries like Singapore and Canada and USA and Japan, have what they call budget deficits. In other words, they spend more than what they actually collect. The reason why they do do that, in particular for post-colonial post -colonial countries like ours, is because we have to spend a lot of money in infrastructure. So, the budget deficit here is as a percentage of your GDP. What is GDP? It's your gross domestic product. What is your gross domestic product? It's essentially the value of your goods and services. At the moment, ours is about $10 billion in, in Fiji. The, the, in fact, the GDP has gone up from $6 billion to about $10 billion. It's growing quite exponentially. The idea with it, this is zero. There's only been about three times or four times that we've actually had a surplus. In other words, we've actually had more money left over at the end of the year. In 2008 we did do that, but that's more of a quirk. It was not necessarily by design. It's because sometimes when you have underspending, you spend less because of whatever reason, then you don't get to spend the money, so therefore you have a surplus. The trick, of course, is to make sure that these blue lines don't go down too far. So the shorter the lines, the better it is. We don't like cyclones because we have to spend money. People die because of cyclones. Sewage pipes get washed away, roads get washed away, buildings get damaged, schools get damaged, whatever it is. Cyclone Winston, 6,000 kilometers of electrical cables went down. We have to put them up. It costs money. So this is what deficit is about. You can see we've been actually trying to go down. Overall, fiscal deficit since 2007 has been at 2.4%, which is actually a good space to be in. I'll talk to you about this later also. Total government revenue. The total amount of money we collect in a year, 2004 we collected $1.1 billion, the then government. Today we collect $3.8 billion. We have tripled our revenue. How have we tripled our revenue? Because we're a lot smarter at collecting revenue. There's obviously some tax measures, but also we are being very heavy on compliance. As announced uh, uh, publicly, we actually have, like one supermarket chain has recently been through an audit, they've actually had to pay $53 million because they've been not paying the taxes. There are many other entities like that. So we need to be able to collect the right taxes. We're able to collect the right taxes, it increases our revenue. When our revenue increases, that means we have more of a savings. When we have more of a savings, it means we have to borrow less. Sorry. Uh, total government expenditure, what we've done for you is actually put together infrastructure development, health, education, access to justice, and social protection together. These are what we call the social sectors. Infrastructure development as it speaks, roads, bridges, jetties, electricity, etc., water connections, health, spending on health, it includes doctor's salaries. Doctors, as you know, about two years ago, got a pay rise of about 80%, the top tier ones, others receive about 40-50% pay rises. And uh, education, of course, is yourself, including free education. Access to justice, which is legal aid. Places like Kandavu, Ovalau, Nambuwalu, all these places now have legal aid offices. It's a constitutional requirement. Legal aid now also provides advice and writes your wills. If you earn below a particular income level, they can write your will. They do probates domestic violence, maternity cases, uh, paternity cases, custody battles, and of course criminal matters also. And now we've expanded the scope. There are a lot of tenants who may be illegally being evicted, or people, tenants whose uh, leases are expiring, for them to be able to get some legal recourse. Legal Aid also provides assistance to them also. Social protection, is, oh, sorry. Social protection is important to know this. 
for the first time we're paying disability allowance. We also started a particular scheme called the pensions. A few years ago, those over the age of 70, we started giving them uh, $30 a month. These are for people who have never had FNPF. There are many women who have never worked for anybody. There are many villagers, many farmers, cane farmers, whatever kind of farmers they may be. They have never worked for anybody, so they never had FNPF. So, we started off by giving them $30 a month. Uh, if you're over the age of 70, we brought it down to 68, we give $50. Now in the budget, if you're 65 years and over, you get $100 a month. Applicable to both husband and wife. Some people asked the question and said, well, I had my FNPF, I will do it 20 years ago, can I get it? We said, no. It's only for those people who've never had FNPF. So your teachers, you need to tell people about that. And we've increased the funding, you can see it's gone from 1.3 to 4.3 billion dollars. This is very important, expenditure mix. Every year when we spend money, there are two types of areas that we spend money. Today we are here, we've hired this hall, we've had your afternoon tea, we pay for the fuel, I'm staying at a hotel in Nandi tonight, we pay for the toilet paper, the photocopying machine, your salaries. These are what we call operating expenditure. So you spend this money, you've got nothing to show for it the following year. The other expenditure is what you call a capital expenditure, where you spend money to build things. You build a road, you build a school, nursing station, electricity connection, water connection. That's what you call capital expenditure. Now, any good, good government will actually try and spend more money in capital expenditure, in particular when you are borrowing. Now, the example I used to give the students in the budget consultations was, I said to them, assuming we all want to have a party at McDonald's, we don't have money, so we go to ANZ or whichever bank and we, they give us money to have a party at McDonald's. We go and have the party at McDonald's, eat the burger, drink the Coke or whatever it is, then we go off to sleep. In the morning we wake up, the Coke is gone, the drinks are gone, but the debt is still there. If you borrow money to build something, when it's built, you wake up in the morning, the debt is there, the building is there. After a while, the debt is gone, but the building is still there. Okay? So, comparison. 2004, 83% of the money that government spent went into operating expenditure. In other words, you had nothing to show for it the following year. Only 17% went into capital expenditure. Today, we spend only 59% in operating. But a whopping 41% in capital expenditure. Those of you, for example, you've seen the four-lane road, you know, out of Nandi going through Namaka, Matintar. Now, we build that four-lane road now, but you don't have to build a four-lane road for the next 20, 30 years, because it'll be, it can cater for the traffic. Now, one of the things we've also done, when we were actually doing the plans for this, we were asked, they said, look, if you put the cables underground, it'll cost you $25 million more, $20 million more. So we made the decision. So if you drive now, next time, please notice, there's no overhead cables. We put the cables underground. We've taken the water pipes and put as much as possible, put the water pipes on the side of the road. Most places over here in Latoka and Suva, when they used to build the roads before, they used to put the water pipes underneath the road. So when there's a water leakage in the pipe, the road breaks up, we say, oh, too many potholes. Then eventually somebody smartens up and says, oh, there's a leakage in the pipe. So you dig up the road to fix up the pipe. You fix up the pipe, but you don't fix up the road. Right? So you cause, you actually incur two costs to fix up one problem. So what we've done, for example, with that four laning of the road, Water Authority said, we actually have a water plant to put big water pipes because Nandi is becoming big and we want to do this in 2019. We said, no, you bring your project, your capital project forward. Do it now so you don't want to break up the nice road. So that's what you call also building resilience. You know, everybody talks about climate change. You're building resilience in the infrastructure. So next time there's a cyclone in Nandi, nothing is there to blow down, everything is underneath. So that's where some of the expenditure also goes. So that's actually good investment. Funding for education, you can see, compare that, 270. This increase over here, that's what free education brought about. Free education, of course, then tells, toppers. This has increased over here, of course, with the $170 million rebuild program for the schools. Sorry, how are you spending that money? Ministry of Education gets $490 million. 
These are the universities. USP gets 30 million from us. 69 million goes to FNU. University of Fiji 3.4. Others, which includes like Corpus Christi, Montfort Boys Town, Sangam Nursing School. I think the Vivekanan, one of the colleges there, the, the agricultural arm, they get it. And then of course you have Tells, Toppers. These are the existing scholarships that's finishing off. You know, the what used to be called the the Fijian Affairs Board Scholarship and the Multi-Ethnic. So there are still some people finishing off and that will actually go to zero very soon. And of course, the, the rehab for the schools. That won't be a uh, recurring cost. It's a one-off cost. And once those schools are rebuilt, that 170 million will go off the following year. Funding for roads and bridges, I can, you know, good old PWD days, $55 million, $528 million. You'll see, for example, those of you who live in Latoka, there's going to be substantial upgrade like the footpaths, lightings, uh, roads, and all of those sorts of things. They all come into that uh, particular capital expenditure. Please tell me if you want me to go a bit slow. Water and energy, same thing. There are people, there are, pe there are people, until very recently, were drinking water from creeks, drinking water from uh, wells that had dead poles in it. You'd be surprised. A lot of these people are now connected to electricity and it's very, very important to connect them to electricity, to water. Some of them will be building uh, internal, uh, not internal, but what we call uh, parochial uh, uh, reservoir systems, only confined to that particular area. One important area is this. If you have a household that earns less than $30,000 a year, you are entitled to get subsidized electricity costs. A unit cost of that is 34 cents a unit. We pay 17 cents of that for you. If you have a household that earns less than $30,000 a year. Now, one of the things we did do, which we changed in this budget before, under the subsidy scheme, if you earn less than $30,000 a year, and you use up to 95 kilowatts of electricity, we paid 17 cents. But the moment you went over 95, we did not pay you a single cent. Under this budget, it's been changed. We now pay up to 100 kilowatts. But even if you use more than 100 kilowatts, we still subsidize for you until 100 kilowatts. So it's a wider span of that. So you need to tell people, you people obviously are community leaders in your own areas. People need to know that. We also give subsidized water up to 90,000 liters of free water for households that's earning less than $30,000 a year. Funding for health. Like I said, our greatest challenge in health is the lack of personnel. I think it's a tragedy that in 21st century Fiji, we don't have a single Fijian doctor that if any one of us has a heart attack now, that they can do an open heart surgery. Not one single Fijian doctor that can do that. Now why has that happened? Because there's been a complete lack of investment in our human resources. You cannot expect somebody who's done an MBBS to come out of university, cut you open and play around with your heart. You need somebody to have at least 10, 15 years of exposure. You just send them overseas to get the training. We have one Dr. Biribo who's recently come back from New Zealand who's a neurosurgeon. So now there are certain surgeries that can be done in Fiji because we've actually had the investment done in him. Until such time, we will then actually have to get specialists from overseas. And there's some announcements we've made in particular with Latoka Hospital which you'll see uh, very soon. So that's our greatest challenge as far as the health system is concerned. This is what I talked about earlier on, operating savings. This is how much money we make from the blue line all the way to the top to there. If you take out your operating expenditure, in other words, we make enough money now to pay for all our operating expenditure. Your salaries, your fuel, your toilet paper, your photocopying paper, whatever it is, every single thing we meet from our operating revenue. And we have a savings. You can see the savings here. You can, you can actually get this from the website. You don't actually have to copy it. Uh, operating savings is there. So our operating savings at the moment is $896 million, which means we actually are having a surplus, which means we have to borrow less. It's a good position to be in. A lot of people talk about debt in Fiji without knowing about it, including some politicians. Now, issue about debt is this. The line that you need to be concerned about is this line here. What do you call your debt to GDP ratio? This is what you call your nominal debt. In other words, your nominal amount. So, 
I'll give you an example to bring it in perspective. Assuming our GDP is $100, our total value of our goods and services is $100. You can say in simple terms, colloquially speaking, that's our wealth. If it's $100, we go and borrow $20. Okay? So you'll say your debt to GDP ratio is 20%. 20 of 100 is 20%. Then your wealth increases to $500. And then you go and borrow $50, which is two and a half times more than 20. So even though you borrow two and a half times more, as a percentage of a GDP, it's only 10%. So the richer you get, the ability to borrow is increased. So as I told you, our revenue has tripled since 2004, which means we have the ability to borrow more but the trick is, when you borrow, you must borrow to build. Because when you borrow to build, you're actually increasing your productive capacity. So if you see here, even though the debt in 2006 was $2.8 billion, it was 53.3% of our total GDP, because our GDP was smaller. Today, our debt is $5.2 billion, but it's only 47.5%. In fact, it would have been lower. Why did it go up here? You see, it was coming down. Why did it go up here? Because of Winston. We had to borrow over $220 million. Now, what is really interesting is this. This $5.2 billion, $2.2 billion, we inherited from the previous government. You see, the Ratavara government took out a loan. So when the Rabuka government came in, they have to pay that loan, including the loan they've incurred. When the Chaudhary government came in, they have to pay the other guys' loans off and also their new loan that they've incurred. Garasa government came in, they have to pay those loans too, including their loan. We have to do the same too. So Fiji has never defaulted on any of its loans, irrespective of whoever borrowed the loan, borrowed the money. So that's part and parcel of running a country well. You have to pay off your debts. Because the debt is not written as the Alliance government debt or the Labour Party debt, or the SDL debt, or Sodelpa debt, whatever it may be, or the Fiji First debt, is the debt of the Republic of Fiji. So all governments have to honour that debt. So, but just for information, that 2.2 actually is from the previous governments. Now, this is a comparison for you. What do the other countries look like? Look at Japan. Debt to GDP ratio is 239.2%. The debt runs in trillion dollars. USA, 107.4%. In other words, the debt levels they have is more than the value of their wealth, of their GDP. That's what it means. Uh, Maldives, I mean, these are comparable countries. These are island nations in the Indian Ocean. 81.5, 68.6, Nauru, 65%. Mauritius, Mauritius is an interesting country. I, went, I had the privilege of going to Mauritius this year. Mauritius actually, their GDP was lower than Fiji's in the late 1960s. They also grow sugarcane. But the interesting thing is now this. The sugarcane plantations in Mauritius is actually owned by six companies only. It's corporatized. Whereas we have small farmer holdings. They have company holdings. But what Mauritius said, hang on, we cannot be dependent on sugar alone. They also have, similar to us, tourism. They said we need to branch off in different areas. So what did they do? They did something to what we are doing, but on a much bigger scale. They put in four-lane roads. The government actually invested in IT parks. Why? Because they have a natural advantage. They are very close to Africa. Law and order situation in Mauritius is good. It's a modern place with the roads. It is sort of, you know, a developing country, but they modernized the place. What they did then, that they went out internationally. And they went, for example, to India. They got in three Indian hospitals and set up state-of-the-art hospitals, giving tax incentives. So they now go and market themselves to the Africans. They say, you don't need to go to Europe for surgery. You don't need to go to India for surgery. Come to Mauritius. We offer you everything. So all the international companies, large international companies, are now based in Mauritius to service Africa. You know, because Africa's got this image like it's unstable, it's unsafe and all of that. So they service Africa from Mauritius. So their debt in nominal terms is actually 6 billion US dollars. Our debt is in US terms about 2 billion dollars. But 
it goes to show even though their debt levels as per GDP is higher than ours, they're in a good space because they've invested in areas where it's giving them productive capacity. So it's good to incur the debt if you're going to increase the wealth of your country. The simple example that I give to the students is this. The villager who's catching fish or the fishermen, wherever they are in Fiji catching fish, when they don't have electricity, when they catch the fish, when they sell the fish, if they don't get to sell the fish by the afternoon, they reduce the price of the fish. Because they know they, don't, they can't store it. If they don't sell it for half the price or one-tenth the price, they have to eat it themselves or give it to their neighbor or it rots. The moment you give them electricity, they won't reduce their price. Because they know they've got their fridge or their cooler. They won't reduce the price, they won't put it in the cooler. Next day they'll put it out on the road, throw water on it, you drive past and say fresh fish for sale. <laughs> but their income level has increased. They have not brought down their price. So you need to be able to target those areas where you increase the productive capacity of your country and able to be attract investment. We are spending about $9 million to land a cable in Vanua Levu, you know, for internet connection. This will mean that the rate of internet connectivity or the speed will increase by about 100% in Vanua Levu. What does that mean? It means you can have IT companies set up in Vanua Levu. There are too many people migrating from Vanua Levu to Viti Levu. That's why when you go and see a soccer match in Suba or Nasori, they're full of Lambasa supporters. The reason they're coming here because there is not enough opportunities. So as a government, we need to be able to create those opportunities. You see, we were doing, for example, electricity in rural areas, Korobuto, other places in Duvu, and you'll see a lot more happening. What does that mean? Apart from the fact it creates safety and all of that, women can walk to the shop at night. It means the people who are selling barbecue, who are selling hot sila, they can trade at night. So you feel safe when you drive along to stop there and buy the chutney or the mango or the sila. So it increases the commercial capacity of those people. So you need to be able to think about the economic well-being in terms of your infrastructure uh, development. So you can see where Fiji sits and all the others. So whilst the show is 41.1, if you take it a nominal value, the value of the debt is quite high compared on a dollar to dollar value. What are the things we've done? Can I just quickly take you through this? Okay. Now, we've been growing continuously now for eight years. Even though we had Winston over here, <coughs> because the economy is in a strong position, it slowed down, but we still were growing. We expect to grow for another eight to ten years, more, unprecedented levels. But the trick is, ladies and gentlemen, that won't happen if you don't have consistency in policy. You need to have consistency in policy because that was what, that's what creates investor confidence. What are the areas that contribute to our growth? Agriculture, 0.34%. Fisheries and forestries is terrible. Very little. So there's capacity there, there may be problems there that we need to explore. Manufacturing is huge, construction is huge. As I mentioned, you know, construction industry in Suva, welders, I know that gentleman has gone, welders are getting paid $15, $16 an hour. You have bricklayers. I had construction company people coming to me say, can you pass a new law regarding the construction industry? I said, why? They said, you know, I had about 10 people, I'm paying them 7 or $8 an hour to lay bricks. I went to the job site and they've all gone. And I said, where? He said, two sites down, they're paying them $1.50 more an hour. Huge demand. Electricians are being paid $12, $13 an hour. A huge movement in the construction industry. This is one area that we believe there's a lot of opportunities, financial services, in particular in IT. Our objective as government is to ensure to have what we call broad-based growth. We should not be dependent on only one or two or three things. We should be dependent on a cross-section of sectors to contribute to the economy. We were lucky in Winston from one perspective. It did not affect the tourism areas. If it had, it would have been a dire straits. Dire straits. In the same way within the tourism sector, Nearly 67% of tourists who come to Fiji come from Australia and New Zealand. 51% comes from Australia, 16% comes from New Zealand. If there is an economic downturn in those two countries, what will happen to our sector? 
This is why we want more Indians, we want more Chinese, we want more Middle Easterners, we want more Europeans to come to Fiji. So if one country goes down, we still, our, we don't go down. So that's what you call spreading your risk. In the same way, if we have more areas contributing to growth, we will be dependent on broad-based economic growth. And that's what we're trying to do. We're setting up a flying school, in, uh, uh, simulator school. Why are we doing that? To get in more income into Fiji. Not just to train our people, but get more income. We already had companies from Australia and New Zealand wanting to come and use our simulator school. It hasn't even started. We haven't even dug the ground for groundbreaking ceremony. It will start in the end of next year, but we are attractive because you're competitively priced. Inflation, very important. As you can see, we generally, small countries like ourselves, we are price takers. One of the areas that affects our inflation rate are two major things. World fuel price, we're simply price takers. If tomorrow they push up the price of fuel to $140 a barrel, we have to pay for it. We've got no choice. We're not even a million people. We don't even have our own oil. Over here, the price of world fuel is about $145 a barrel. That's why inflation goes up. This electricity, only about 65-70% is generated by Monosabu. If you put Nandari Batu, Nandari Batu and some of, the, some of the other renewable areas together, it's probably about 72-73% in peak period, when you have enough water. Other times it's run by diesel. Diesel is important fossil fuel. This is why we talk about renewable energy. The other thing that actually affects uh, inflation is cyclones. Yangona till today is $120 a kilo. Some people still drink it at the same rate. That's a different story. In Suva, a bunch of bananas after Cyclone Winston cost 20 bucks. A bundle of beans cost five dollars. Of course, those areas, the prices are stabilizing. This is why you see the inflation rate coming down at two percent. But you know, hopefully, God willing, that the world price of fuel does not go up. Because then it affects our inflation rate. This is a very important issue that many people don't understand. I'll use this lady as an example. She's wearing this watch, she's got this handbag, nice yellow handbag, she's wearing a chain, she's probably got gel in her hair. Every single thing that I've mentioned is not made in Fiji. The top she's wearing is probably sewn in Fiji, but the fabric comes from overseas. So when you buy things from overseas, including this mic that I'm holding, you don't buy it in Fijian dollars. You buy it in US dollars, Japanese yen, euros. Australian dollars, New Zealand dollars. So you need to have enough of that type of currency to be able to trade. That's what you call your foreign reserves. Now generally, when your foreign reserves are low, colloquially speaking, people say, if they don't have enough foreign reserves, they say, oh, this country is going bankrupt because they cannot trade. International benchmark says you should have, this is the number of months here on the side, you should have at least four months worth of foreign reserves to be seen to be stable. 2005, foreign reserves was at $549 million. Only 2.3 months of foreign reserves. Today we have a whopping $2.3 billion in foreign reserves. Highest it's ever been in Fiji, which is about 5.8 months worth of foreign reserves. In a good position. Now this also has an impact on your international standing. When we go and borrow money, we are able to actually negotiate better rates. When Fiji Airways bought the brand new A330s, they also borrow money from European banks. So they're able to negotiate better. European banks will immediately look at this. How are your foreign reserves? If your foreign reserves are low, it's a risky country. Maybe they won't be able to do our repayments in US dollars. These loans are done in repayment in US dollars. So if your foreign reserves are high, it's not a bad country, we can reduce the interest rate. The same way when you go to, go to a bank and borrow money, if you have good collateral, you reduce the interest rate because they know if you default, they can get those assets. Similarly with borrowing internationally. This is one part of the economy a lot of people don't understand, which has an enormous bearing on your ability to trade. Uh, this is just the funding for universities. Actually, I'll, can I just go back? Uh, ECAL is very important. 
Uh, as you know, that uh, that's called the Environment and Climate Adaptation Levy. It used to be called the Environmental Levy, we've now called it DECAL, but we've increased it to 10%, but reduces service, over, service turnover tax. ECAL is not paid by everybody. ECAL is only paid if you go and eat at a restaurant in Denaron. If you go and hire a rental car, you can stay at a hotel. If you go and watch the movies, you pay ECAL. So ECAL is applicable to areas what we call they are the basic necessities of life. So mainly tourists pay ECAL because you stay at a lot of the hotels. If you want to go and hire a jet ski, you pay ECAL at the tourism areas. We collected approximately 70 to 75 million dollars last year from environmental levy. We expect to collect about 20 million dollars, uh, 90 million dollars in this financial year. But we brought about a new law, a self-imposed law, and that was from next year onwards, every single cent of money that we collect through ECAL, we only can spend it in environment and climate adaptation. But more so, we have to publicly publish where this money has gone to. So we have to present it at the airport, we have to send it to schools and in the towns and cities so you know exactly where the money has gone to. So for example, the Ministry of Environment can be funded through this. We have relocated three villages to higher ground because of encroaching waters. There's another 42 to 45 villages that need to be relocated in the next few years. There are certain sugarcane farms in Vanuatu that they cannot plant anything on it because of the salination of the soil, because of encroaching waters. So you have to build dikes, you have to build you know, walls and what have you. That's where the expenses will go to. It's got nothing to do with the 10 cents plastic bag, that they call ECAL. We don't collect that much money from that. I talked to you about the construction industry, you can look at it. I mean, we've sort of reduced duty in the construction areas and what have you. Um, sorry. I don't know, I know some taxi drivers, uh, teachers tend to have taxi permits. So maybe I'll talk to you about that very quickly. Um, if you have a taxi permit, from 1st of October your taxi permit will automatically get a 10 year permit. Right? Now why have we done that is because we want to build an asset for you. Because we need to improve the quality of public service vehicles in Fiji. The current situation is, you only have a three year permit. When you have a three year permit, when you go to the bank to get a loan for buy a taxi, they give you a five year loan. Why should I get a five year loan when I know perhaps that my permit may not be renewed? So I don't take the risk, so people don't invest in taxis. You see the old rickety taxis. We've similarly done that for buses, you know the omnibuses, the big buses. They will now get a 15 year automatic permit. Both for taxis, minibuses and the omnibuses, the permit you get now is your asset. So if I have a permit, I can go along to this lady and say, do you want to buy a taxi permit? And she says, yes, I'll offer you $20,000. I may go to you, say, I've got a taxi permit, I'll give you $25,000, I'll sell it to you. I can do that now. So suddenly, you're empowering people with an asset value. So I can sell it to you. LTA can't stop me unless, of course, you're a terrorist or I'm discharged bankrupt. Okay? So we can do that. I also, if I go to the bank, I can use my permit as a collateral. In other words, a lot of banks actually charge high interest rates and look, this is also my collateral. If I don't do the loan repayment, you can auction my or mortgage sale my permit. We've also done a deal with the Reserve Bank of Fiji. People who own less than three taxis, if they want to get a loan, they won't pay an interest rate of more than 5%. Bus companies that have gross turnover of less than $1.5 million, they also, if they want to buy a new bus, they don't pay more than 5%. We have a big problem, those of you may know Suva and Nasino, to travel from Nasino to Suva now, in peak period, takes about an hour and a half. I'm sure you have traffic problems here too. But we need more people to take public transportation. That's the only solution. But we cannot do that because some people do not take the bus, because they still got the tarpaulin as the window. Right? None of the lawyers from the Solicitor General's office will ever see them catch the bus. How many people do you see wearing suits catching the bus? They'll always go in a taxi. Because the mindset we have in Fiji about catching buses is that people, you know, professionals don't catch buses. But those professionals, when they go to Sydney, they'll take the bus, they'll take the train, they'll take the ferry. So as I say, we need to make public transportation a lot more attractive, a lot more sexy. So, We've got
got a four-lane road that will be completed between Nasori and Suva very soon. So what we can do very soon is that we can have one lane dedicated as a bus lane. That's what they do, for example, places like Sydney. So between 6.30 a.m. and 9 a.m., that lane can only be used by buses. So I can get on the bus, go to my work, get there really quickly, within 20 minutes, half an hour. It's cheaper for me too, less of a carbon footprint for Fiji. But you can't automatically do that and create a bus lane when nobody wants to get on the bus lane or get on the bus. You need to fix up the buses first. That's one of the things that we have done. Inter-island shipping, we've reduced duty and all of that. Uh, if you have a motor vehicle, the duty will be reduced for spare parts. You know, as I mentioned to you, 69.4% of the population is below the age of 40. Younger people tend to make more babies. In the past few years, we've actually reduced the duty of number of baby products to make it easier for them to have babies. So things like we've continued with that. So for example, things like, sorry, like, you know, baby wipes, baby shoes, baby cots, we've reduced the duty of zero rate of duty. So, you know, a wipe is an essential for, for parents. So we zero rate of duty on that altogether. But we have a big problem. Nearly 60 to 70 percent of the items in the supermarkets in Fiji that you see, in particular food items, are brought into Fiji only by five or six companies. They have the wholesale, what they call the exclusive rights, sole agency of those products. So they are the ones who are making the margin. So even though we have zero rated duty, like cereals, you know, things like cornflakes, we zero rated duty zero percent a couple of years ago. We know that the cornflakes or whatever it is lands at $2.70 a box or cotton, or sometimes $2.50. But it's retail at $10, at $9. So the guy or the company that has the exclusivity for that lands it about $2.50, $2.70, then goes to all the supermarkets and sells it to them for $7 or $8. Then the supermarket puts up his or her margin and then you get it for $10. I mean, things like neutral grain cost 20 bucks. It should not be the case. So in the budget, if you heard the announcement we made, we're getting the Commerce Commission and we're setting up an economic intelligence unit in the Ministry of Economy to go behind the scene and look at those people who have monopolistic positions in the market. And then also do margin uh, pricing for them too. They have to justify. I mean, the case in point is Johnson & Johnson baby products. Only one company has the sole agency for that. When we zero rated duty on these products, the price still went up. Because the guy is making a killing. He now doesn't have to pay duty and he socks the price because he's the only guy in the market. So recently when they spoke to him, he said, well, you know, if I reduce the price here, I have to reduce the price in Tonga because I have the exclusive agency for the entire South Pacific. So our position is we don't care what you do in Tonga, in Fiji you need to do the right thing. So we're doing quite a few things behind the scenes and hopefully they'll see an enormous reduction uh, in the pricing. Unfortunately, uh, this exclusive position of some of the uh, companies is leading to a lot of greed. Other areas, uh, things like, you know, we've done things like toweling fabric or towels. At the moment, you go into the market and buy a market and buy a towel, you wipe your body with the towel, the water is still there, but the towel slides off. That's the quality of towels that we have in Fiji. So we've reduced the duty on it. I mean, it's a fact. Now, these are some of the things that we looked at, you know, everyday usage to try and bring down the price so your quality of your life actually improves. There's quite a few other things that we've done uh, there. The sin goods, what do you call the sin goods? Tobacco, alcohol, carbonated drinks, they've all gone up in, in duty, of course. Uh, I've done all that. Uh, very, very quickly, a last slide, please, because I have to go to bar. The TELS, we've increased the allowances for the TELS students. Those who receive 4,300 before now get 6,600. Those who receive 5,700 now get 7,125. We now pay the students over their holidays too because they still have to rent their you know, accommodation or whatever it is. Um, we also now have uh, no longer required guarantors. You see, you finish your uh, year 13. You go straight into university, you get a place you no longer require a guarantor. Yes, the only time you need a surety if you are leaving the country. We've had some students, unfortunately, who finished their degrees and the tells and they've taken off. Migrated. Gone with the wind. 
So we obviously need to ensure that we have some surety there. Students now, if they fail a subject, can also get tells. So we allow them to repeat. Before tells did not allow that, we expect sometimes, you know, students may have valid reasons. They can also change their courses. Before tells did not allow that, this is a change we made. You know, you may say, okay, I want to go to university and do accounting. Six months into the course, you may say, actually, I don't want to do accounting, I want to do economics. Uh, I want to do economic, uh, you know, accounting HR as opposed to uh, accounting IT. So that allows them to do that. You can also upgrade your qualification from diploma to degree. Uh, we've also said that there are certain courses, engineering courses at FNU, where they accept students even if they have not done year 13. They allow year 12 students to come in. They will also be now eligible for TELS, and only for certain courses at FNU. This is a new thing. Uh, we give a $300 startup to students who finish their degree only if they come from low income families, earn less than $30,000 a year. You know, uh, you may be from Lambasa, you may be from Nandari Vatu, wherever. You want to go for a job interview, you don't have a suit. You want to buy a suit. People travel from inter island or you know, maritime areas. They don't have enough money for uh, ferries and all of that. So we give them $300, it's a grant. Somebody said to me, what if they take the $300 and have a big beer party? Well, we can't stop it. Bad luck to them, but we give them a level of confidence. But at least we're giving them a start. Some of your jobs may require you to buy certain equipment or whatever it is, so we give them a $300 start for that. Toppers and all of that has, of course, increased. These are some of the other areas that we put in place. Um, now, this is where you can get this information, ladies and gentlemen. All of this information is available. Uh, www.economy.gov.fj, you can find the budget estimates. The budget estimates is a very detailed document. So if you can go to the Ministry of Education budget estimate, you'll see how much the department, the curriculum department is getting. How much is the your divisional offices, you know, the offices are getting, all of that. Uh, we've also done this thing called the budget flyers. For each of the ministries, the key expenditure areas. We've also done for Water Authority Fiji, Rural Electrification, and also for FRA, we've done specific spend. So you can go to WEF's flyer, and see which village will get how many water tanks and what's the size of the water tank. You will also go and see you know, how we grew electrification. Ram Prasad and 10 others have applied to get electricity. You will see how many homes are there, what's the cost of bringing electricity to them. You see entire breakdown. So you will know exactly all these projects will get implemented in that year, uh, area. Please have a look at that. We've got, got a lot of details. Where will the new roads be, uh, be built? Uh, etc. Sorry. Oh, you don't, we don't need to do this, but you can go through all of this. It's there. These are all the details. So these are major grid extensions. A lot, lot of information there. So ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's the budget in a, in a nutshell. Uh, thank you for your attendance uh, this afternoon. And uh, as I said, if you have any queries, csrmu.enquiries at gmail.com. And we look forward to your input. I think we're in a very good space. Uh, we want to work together with you uh, as professionals to be able to give you a very better environment for you to be able to deliver what you do deliver best, and that is as a teacher. Thank you very much, and I wish you a good afternoon. Thanks.